You're very welcome to another episode of the Scaling Your Business podcast. On this episode, I'm joined by Ronan O'Dalig, the founder and CEO of Thriftify. Ronan, you're very welcome to the podcast. Thanks, man, for having me on. Happy to be yeah, here. Yeah, delighted to have you on. Typical fashion with the podcast is we, we go back to chapter one and work our way from there. What I mean by that is we kind of go back to the very early influences and work our way through challenges, pivotal moments, and, and see where we end up, keep it more conversational. So if we bring you right back to the start, I believe you grew up in Clondalkin, that's Dublin, for any of our international listeners. Have you got any favorite uh, memories throughout your early years or a, as a young Ronan? Yeah, good question. I, I think um, like I grew up in a cul-de-sac and a housing estate and it was just kind of during the summer, it was like 13 hours of being out on the road playing with gangs of people, you know, and different people coming and um bumping into us on the street different gangs from different estates and just the just constant socializing i think has to be and football endless amounts of football on the road yeah. uh were probably the the best memories um and i think it's a, it's, a, it's an interesting one because you actually you learn social skills that way you know and there's there's arguments and there's romances and there's everything you know so it's kind of a it was definitely a kind of a, a good socializing period of, yeah you've mentioned football have you got a team of choice um, not really. I'm I'm more into Gaelic football. Um, uh, so I'm obviously a big Dubs fan. Um, and I play for an Irish language GEA club that a few of us had to set up in college. Actually, was that's another kind of passion of mine. Um, but no, I've always been into sports. Yeah. Nice. Uh, do you think that Dublin will do it again this year? <laughs> um, well, like the draw with the draw with Kerry there recently was it was great. Like I don't think anyone wants to see major dominance of one team but I think uh, you know uh, I think Dublin are in a chance and I think they're kind of obviously we're in a chance but I think the um, I think it was I find it really interesting like looking at sports and business performance and all of that kind of stuff because it, it's none of the other teams sign up to the agreement that Dublin should be taken down a notch or Dublin should be split in two or we should make it harder for Dublin like mm. it's not a single other athlete in any of the other teams who's ever come out and said that and the reason is because they want to beat the best you know so yeah. I think it's it's quite interesting to look at you know dominance in sport and how people react to that and it's the people who are actually uh, ambitious who want to rise to that level and not the detractors um, so yeah no, I'm a big Dubs fan yeah I would always yeah can't imagine Dublin ever being split into no, well, hopefully they're not. It would be a shame if they were. I'm actually a Kilkenny fan. Both of my parents and all my family are from Kilkenny. We wouldn't tell from my accent. I'm, I'm based up in uh, Ritoth, so on the border of Dublin and Meath. Um, but I can tell you firsthand, having Kilkenny dominated for so many years, that you will not enjoy it when, if a, a time comes that Dublin aren't dominating and you'll wish for those times to come back. So mm -hmm. uh, uh, you'll probably hope that they continue to dominate because now Kilkenny not winning every single year uh maybe we'll make awesome. for good when they do win again if they win again but uh it was certainly good those years where they won all the time um talk to me still about your childhood years who do you think had the biggest impact on you when you were growing up or inspired you the most um yeah good question i mean I, i've had lots of um i've had lots of influences in childhood like um whether that be family you know my dad um he had his own company as well um, and struggled with it through the recession. Um, I think a lot of my friends were very influential on me as well. Um, but I think, I think actually, you know, for, for a lot of my childhood, I was just very, very curious and a little bit introverted. Um, and I wasn't necessarily looking at kind of, you know, a major celeb or, or anyone super influential or inspirational. I was just trying to figure stuff out and I was always incredibly curious, you know, and actually the stuff that gave me, the people who I resonated with most with were people who could answer questions for me, you know, like smart people who knew stuff, you know, whether I had, there was a, I had a few teachers who were really, really good. Um, and I remember at some stage, like I'd stay after school just to, especially with my science teacher, when I was kind of uh, early teenage years, I was just to ask her so many questions like how does this work and how does that work and I was just curious just really really curious you know and I think uh, that maybe I've lost a little bit of that curiosity recently we're just so busy but it's something you need to kind of stoke and 
um luckily then i had opportunities as a as a kid and as an adolescent to to, to stoke those that curiosity yeah uh, do you think that your father uh, who also started a business potentially had an influence or impact on you starting your business um i think so yeah i think you know a lot of the research suggests that people who have parents who own businesses are much more likely to set up businesses mm. um and I wonder, you know, is it that we just mirror our parents and, and do what they do? But I think for me, actually, like, I wanted, my initial plan wasn't to set up a business at all. It was to go and work at a major corporate. Um, I thought I wanted to be a kind of a corporate executive, you know. And mm. I did that. I did that for a while. I did that for, I didn't, no, didn't become a corporate executive, but worked in a corporate in Unilever for a year. And it was really soul destroying. Like I just realized this, if I want to enjoy life, I, I can't spend my time here. You know, it's just not for me. And I need to do something that enables me to follow my interests and my passions. And this is not it. So um, it was helpful that, you know, my dad was there to give advice and all the rest, but actually he was quite frank and honest about the challenges of it. You know, he was kind of saying, look, if you're going to do this, it's going to be incredibly difficult. And, it's going to be a hard way of life and um you know you just need to be aware of that fact it's not the very glossy sexy thing that mm -hmm. sometimes it can be made out to be for young people that's for sure looking back on your time at unilever i don't know how long you spent there but um this could potentially be a two-part question are you thankful now that you've done it so you can say that you kind of take that box or potentially uh, scratch the potential future itch of ever on being curious as to what corporate world was like and then do you, the second part of that question would be do you think that others who potentially want to go and start a business should mm -hmm. uh spend some time working in a corporate world to understand what that's like because sometimes uh owning a business is not for everyone yeah yeah no I, i'm definitely thankful i did it um you know i may not have enjoyed every day of it but um it was a, a huge learning experience and i met some really great people um and it did absolutely you know, make it clear to me that I, I need, I wanted a different path. Um, mm -hmm. I, I do think, you know, it's, I, I think, uh, you know, what I say to people generally who are asking me, you know, especially young people and they're considering entrepreneurship um, is really, really, really deeply considerate and only do it if you think you're genuinely 100% passionate about what, what you're doing, you know, don't do it because you see people on Instagram doing it or don't do it because your university have decided to make it something very sexy that they want you to do, you know, which a lot of universities are doing. So the, the research again suggests that the most successful entrepreneurs are older people who have spent a huge amount of time in a specific industry and they understand that industry. They've identified a problem. They have all the networks. They've all the social capital. Maybe they've built up a, a large chunk of savings and then they go and set up the company statistically those people are a lot more successful in entrepreneurship than anybody else any other demographic so what that would suggest is you know if you do if the reason they're successful is because it's, well there's lots of it's multifaceted but they have gotten the experience in the market they already know the customers you know and they already know the challenges and the problems and they can e easily go and pick up the phone to someone they know uh, and sell them their new business so you know that's what the research would suggest but i do think mm. that there is an element of you know you only get one chance you only get you only get one shot in life and i'm not a I, i'm i'm not very religious i i don't think there's an afterlife and uh, i think this is it you know so if, if if you're that way inclined i think you should definitely take a risk on something as well so you know i think it's about that balance of yeah if you're super passionate about it and you think you want to do it go for it um but if you feel like you're only doing it for, you know, maybe the glossy reasons or because you're not 100 percent sure, go and get some experience elsewhere first, and then come back to it maybe. Um, but I, then at the other, the other hand, the other side of the, that coin is, you know, I'm a, a bit of a risk taker and always have been, and I think, I think you have to be. You only get one chance at this. You only get one shot, and why not try something completely different and scary and exciting and, and push yourself outside your comfort zone. We've certainly got the same beliefs. A couple of things I know about you from doing some research is that you, you've already mentioned that you play GAA. <clears throat> you've been to places like Berlin, Greece, America, Washington in America. You're a drone owner, or at least I believe you are, also a dog owner. What's one thing you're into or curious about that not a lot of people would know about you? Oh, good question. Um, 
Yeah, there's, there's probably too much, to be honest. I mean, I think this is, this, I, I would love to spend more time flying my drone um, and uh, <laughs> doing videography. Yeah, I'm, I'm mad into videography, even though I'm really bad at it. Like, uh, I would love to spend more time making videos and uh, inspiring people through video. I think it's a really great yeah. medium and art form, you know um and it's something i'm really really interested in and i have been trying to find more time to do stuff like that um just out of pure interest um and i think it's you know i think it's important actually there probably was a time when i was telling myself you know everything you needs to be everything you do needs to be the the business and you can't do anything else there's no time for hobbies and you need to spend 10 hours 12 hours a day working on your company which is complete rubbish. Like, you know, I don't know, I don't know where that myth came from, but whoever bloody invented it needs to check themselves because like it's totally unhealthy and you end up just not making good decisions. You end up just burnt out. You end up making crap decisions for your company. You end up not enjoying it. And then you end up, you know, not making the progress that you'd make if you spent less time on it. So that's kind of one of the big realizations I've had over the last kind of year and a half, um, especially with the pandemic and the lockdown, is that actually like if you're not if I'm not looking after myself and I'm not doing things that are good for my own well-being, then it, everybody suffers, you know, and, mm. you know, we have a team, we have a team now, 25 people. And what kind of leadership is it for me to go in and, and be completely burnt out and not enjoying the journey? Like, you know, that's not the culture we need or we want. So I think it's in one of the things that I've started to realize is it is really important that not only I do for myself, you know, the things I'm interested in, but actually, that we set the standard as a company in terms of what our culture is and then if people you know people everybody should be enjoying this there should be obviously there's going to be periods of high pressure and all the rest but you know if 80 percent of the time isn't good crack and, and enjoyable and people aren't fulfilled in their work then you know we failed at our job to create a good culture i love it i love it um you spent six years in the reserve defense forces any lessons learned from that or how did you how did that come about in the first place? Yeah, yeah. The, the Reserve Defence Forces are like the, the kind of part-time, the part-time military uh, in Ireland. And mm -hmm. uh, you do it on a voluntary basis. So you go one evening a week and then a couple of camps during the year. Um, and it came about because they, they paid a visit to our school, actually. Uh, and mm -hmm. they were kind of recruit, recruiting people for it. And myself and a friend said we'd give it a try. And yeah, six years later, we he's he, he ended up, he actually ended up getting a job. He went into the permanent defense force and became worked in um, commun the communications wing of the defense forces and has made a really good career from, for himself in IT security, which obviously is a big topic at the moment with all the ransomware stuff. But um, mm -hmm. that's how it came about. And it, it was um, it was a really, really great journey. Yeah, it was, you know, you, you really learn a lot. The first thing, the biggest thing I learned is you, you learn to really love cleaning. <laughs> because... Strange. Yeah, because you have to, you're forced to clean stuff in a way as a 17 year old, you've never thought could be that clean. Um, so like we'd be on a camp somewhere in, in the barracks and you'd be given the job of you and two other 17, 18 year olds, go and clean these, those toilets, you know, after a week of uh, a thousand people being in the barracks. So you go and clean them and then you'd be brought back and they'd be inspected and they'd say, no, it's not good enough, do it again and do it again and do it again and get in your hands and knees and do it until it's properly done. You know, don't be doing this half hours. There's no, there's nothing, there's nothing done in halves. Everything is mm -hmm. done perfectly. And everything has to be done perfectly because people's lives are on the line in hypothetically in those situations. And there's there's military equipment and there's live ammunition and there's it's incredibly, it's a serious thing. Like it's not, it's not a it's not a part-time hobby. You know, if you're doing it, you're doing it a hundred percent. And everything is done hundred percent, you know, not just that kind of cleaning, but I think that's the, it's a good example of it because it kind of showed me that Jesus actually, you know, things can be done incredibly well. You don't need to, you don't need to just do the job. If you want to, you can actually do above and beyond and you can actually, and you can enjoy it. So, you know, we learned over time, to be proud of that work and to say, yeah, I'll clean the toilets. And you know what? They're going to be the cleanest they've ever been. And when I walk away from them, I'm going to be incredibly, incredibly proud that I did a good job, you know? And I think that you can apply that to anything and no matter what your job is. And I think that was something that took, you know, I didn't learn that when I was 17, but it took me a while to appreciate cleaning the toilets. But um, 
I think there was there was lots of other areas like that where we we learned to do things properly and we learned to do things well and appreciate what we've done. Um, and that was that was huge. I think for for any young person to have that kind of appreciation for hard work um, and respect for hard work was was absolutely transformative. I think for me, yeah. There's a good lesson in that. Mm. UNESCO. What was it like? representing yourself at the UNESCO Youth Forum. Again, what brought you there? And what messages do you want people to hear? Do you think there's anything that still needs to be done? Um, yeah, you have definitely really done your research. <laughs> so, like, I, yeah, I was quite active in student politics um, in university and um, was selected for a couple of different things. And one of them was to represent Ireland at the, at the UNESCO, one of the UNESCO World Forums. Um, and it was a very interesting um, forum and conversation. So it was basically young people from all over the world trying to guide the, the UN's youth strategy. Um, and yeah, it was really fascinating. And I think, you know, there was, there was a lot that came out of it. Um, but perhaps the biggest thing was conversations with young people. So at these conferences, there would be loads of different young people from around the world, kind of the late, the, the, old, the oldest they'd be would be maybe 22, 23. Mm. And you'd be having conversations about very serious topics and writing and debating and coming up with uh, papers or suggestions, right, for, for major global issues. And, at a, and the thing that stood out to me was, was the gulf in how the older representatives, so the actual genuine diplomats and representatives of the countries at the conference, how far away they were from from what young people thought like just a, a massive massive gulf in how we felt the world should function or in how we felt things should be addressed and what they were willing or ready to to sign off. it's scary yeah it, it was it was it was really really big major and um i think that that was if one of the, that was a part that was a, at a time in my life when i was starting to dabble in entrepreneurship and starting to kind of kind of put one foot in the real world a little bit and I think it was quite helpful because you realize that you know maybe the rose tinted glasses you have on about how easy it is to get stuff done or how easy it is for people to change the world you know you need to you need to really take those rose tinted glasses off and actually see things as they are for a while mm -hmm. um, and that was definitely something I took away from that was that oh if you want to get stuff done and on a big scale and it can be actually incredibly difficult and it is a huge challenge but no it was um it was a great experience and it was a great opportunity to meet other people who were you know incredibly passionate about what they were doing and that's the other thing i think that's super important is you don't realize how insular ireland is until you travel outside of ireland and i think it's something that holds us back a little bit because you know if you're on if you're in mainland, mainland Europe, it's, it's just so much more dynamic, right? And the spectrum of acceptable debate is a lot wider. So in Ireland, you know, we've had two political parties in control who are very, very close in terms of their center right or, or populist policy, right? Whereas in Europe, they've had parties who range from the far left to the right, sometimes the far right in power. And in government and and what's happened is i feel in ireland our, our our spectrum of debate is is between those two dominant political parties you can be a little bit maybe a little bit center left or you can be right but anything outside of that is non-acceptable is not up for debate you know whereas in other european countries it would be up for debate of course it's up for debate so sure, we had someone in power and they had they achieved that policy and we socialized housing and sure look at the results it was great or we democratized energy mm. or we we did this thing and it worked sure why why wouldn't we debate those things so i do think at times that the, the kind of insular nature of the irish discourse can, can hold us back a little bit and i think i really really saw that as a young person when i traveled and spoke to other people from other countries and saw how radical they were or just how different they were or how in many different ways that, you know they had a completely different outlook on the world um, and, and and I never met anyone like them you know so I think that that was a huge learning as well that I, that I got from all that international travel I did as a young person um, and as and has still is still something I hold quite close to me when I'm talking to Irish people you know I'll, I'll be talking to people who 
maybe haven't haven't had that opportunity or who, who maybe are still quite insular in, in what they're willing to talk about you know and I think you have to be cognizant of that mm-hmm. when you're trying to um progress things about where people's perspectives lie and why they why they why they think the way they think well um in your industry or role industry that you work in a role as a founder is there a, a commonly held belief that you passionately disagree with <laughs> Oh, wow. Um, great question. Um, I think, I, I think the, I think there's a, there's a, there's a belief that maybe hasn't been realized yet. So what we do is we help charity shops to sell used clothes online. Right. And that as a statement, the vast majority of people who hear that think, oh, that's nice. Or, oh, that, that's a nice niche. But then when I explain that, well, actually, um, the demand for used clothing is growing 21 times faster than any other fashion segment. And the fast fashion industry accounts for 10% of all global emissions. And the customers we're dealing with receive 70% of all used garments. And that number in Ireland is two, 300 million garments a year going into these organizations. The picture starts to become a lot clearer. And that picture for us is there's an opportunity to completely change the fashion industry from head to toe, to change how the majority of people engage in fashion, from buying used unsustainable fashion to buying circular fashion that supports the best organizations that exist in our society. Right. And yeah, that rings well, that does. And the thing is, that ambition as as a sentiment and as a statement is enormous. Right. And actually, sometimes our customers are there, have them are the most limited in their beliefs to achieve that. And there's a lot of times where we will try and bring people on that journey. And, and you know, I would have conversations with, it, with organizations that we help who would be receiving tens of millions of garments a year. And I try and explain to them that if you get one percent of your items online, this is the potential revenue that you're going to have to do more of your good, good work. And, and it's just very hard for them to make the leap between where they are now and what the possibility is, what the, what the future might look like. You know, it's, it's, it can be very hard for people to step outside of the day-to-day thing that they've mm. done for decades and get on board with a vision that looks very different to what they do right now. But yeah. I, think that, I think it's inevitable that they will. And I, and I think it's not a question of if, I think it's a question of when and it's a question of who. And what we're trying to do is, is perhaps be one of the organizations that helps achieve that uh, and, and, and presents them with that vision and brings them around to it. Riftify is still a relatively young business. How do you get the word out about a new business? What's, what's, what, what do you believe is crucial? Yeah, uh, persistence. Uh, I mean, it's not even necessarily the how, it's just they don't bloody stop and just talk to everybody and do every little tactic you can. So, I mean, I think, you know, for us, we set ourselves, in hindsight, probably too big of a challenge, but we've committed to it now. And that was to be double-sided. So we sell products uh, on our own channel, direct to the consumer, but our technology is actually powering omni-channel. So when a charity shop uploads a dress for sale on Triftify, that item is actually going for sale on eBay, on Facebook, on Google Shop, and on dozens of other marketplaces. Um, so we're reaching the customer through leveraging other channels, right? Which is the first thing, which I think can be very powerful. If you can find leverage, absolutely use it to the max. But the second thing then for us is as we're going direct to consumer, We've just had to do everything. And, you know, we made a very conscious decision as a team. We sat down and said, right, guys, are we going to do a direct-to-consumer channel as well, or are we just going to do the, the omni-channel solution? And to be honest, we weren't excited about doing just omni-channel. What excited us was building a brand. What excited us was building something that people would talk about, that would spread, that people could engage with, that could have an impact on how people think about fashion. And that was why we decided to do direct to consumer because we felt if we're going to love this and if we're going to get really passionate about this, you know, we want to build something that that people can talk about. And um, that's kept us incredibly passionate, but it's meant that we've had to do a huge amount of work to try and build that brand. And that means 
Social media consistently, it means PR, it means networking, it means interviews, it means SEO, it means Google ads, it means the full remit of digital marketing, even traditional print media, press releases to local, lo local papers. You know, anytime something big happens, I'll send a press release into our local echo where we're from because it's local kid does well kind of stuff. Um, and we leverage that as much as possible. So you just have to do all of that work and you'd have to just keep doing it consistently. And it's a pain in the ass. Like it's, it's a lot of work, but if you want to build a brand, you have to do it and you have to do it all well. Um, now there's a lot more we could be doing and we could be doing the stuff we're doing even better, but we got it. We just have to do that work. Um, so that's on the consumer side. And then just to finish the point on the, on the, on the other side of the platform because obviously mm -hmm. there's no point bringing consumers to the website if there's no stock for sale so we have to get the stock for sale for, from charity retailers and actually that's a lot easier for us because we know who they all are so yeah. you know there's there's in the uk and ireland there's kind of 600 of them who we want um and we know who they are and it's it's just about trying to get a meeting with them so that's a lot easier you know it's a it's a, it's a direct to customer uh, play where you're getting an introduction or you're sending a cold email and uh, we obviously we much prefer an introduction from an existing client but um it's a it's a much easier thing than trying to build a brand you had 260,000 visitors to your site in 2020 and since the third lockdown you said the site's recorded a 79 percent increase in traffic to online sales with the biggest sellers being fashion then followed by books what's the future look like for the rest of 2021 and beyond? Um, it, it, we're on a hyper growth trajectory. And um, for this year, we have uh, an ambition of saving a million kilograms of carbon. Um, and that's a big ambition. Last year, we saved 40,000 kilograms of carbon by, sell, by, sell, by selling used fashion. And this year, we want to save a million. So that'll show you the kind of growth trajectory that we're on. Um, and to achieve that, there's two things that we're focusing on. The first is, is, is new market acquisition. So we're working with over 90%, over 95% of the, the retailers in Ireland. And, and now we're trying to switch the technology on in the UK and get mass market adoption there. It's much harder. It's a much more sophisticated market. There's, there's one or two existing competitors there. Um, mm. But that's the big focus is to, is to drive new new acquisition for charity retailers in the uk so that's the first thing and then the second thing is 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 on the consumer side of things so is really spreading the awareness of the brand uh, and building retention retention is is where everything begins and ends for us it's so much better to to retain a customer than to try and get a new one that's for sure three final questions for you uh, all restrictions are lifted and you can travel to any country in the world where are you going to go to <laughs> Um, I beat it. <laughs> nice. yeah. I don't know if you know. I don't need if you need to go there right now because the sun here is so hot today mm. and yesterday. But uh, yeah, good choice. Don't know who you live with or live with, but your house is burning down. Your loved ones are all safe, but your house is burning down, and you can only save one item. What one item would that be? Is the puppy safe? Because the puppy is definitely the, pup, the puppy safe. <laughs> if puppy if you love safe. the puppy, of course. Um, probably just my notebook. Um, yeah, it's full of full of my stuff and ideas, and is something mm -hmm. I rely on day to day. If I'm not take if I if I don't do a to do list in the evening before for the next day, I will, won't sleep well. Like I'll be stressed out. So that's number one. Yeah, I do similar. I always write down my following days to do list just before I get into bed every night. Uh, mm -hmm. It's it's definitely easier to tackle the next day because then you're just going through a to do list the following day. I'd like you to imagine that we're now having this conversation as in if it's the year 2030. So we're talking right now and it's the year 2030 and you're looking back on the previous decade. What You can answer this personally or professionally, but what would you like to be looking back on? Well, um, I, I think if by 2030, we're not looking back and saying, well done to our governments and to major corporations because we have decarbonized our economy we have given the biggest effort we've ever seen in humanity to changing how society and our economy works for the sake of our climate um, we've completely 
um, changed how our economies function and made them more sustainable and more human centered. Um, if we're not saying that, then we're going to be in a very difficult, we're going to be in a very, very tricky place. Because if we keep going the way we're going, the science projects that there won't be any of these kind of conversations happening. There won't be, there won't be an economy. There won't be cities. There won't be food. Um, that, that's the level of the seriousness that, that we're in. So I think that has to be the number one focus for all of us is to say the economic model we've built is bringing us towards catastrophe and we need to change it and we all need to play our, our part in that. So that would be the first thing. And I think as part of that, you know, where, where I see us playing a role is, is in how people shop. And, you know, our top line mission is to change how and why people shop. So it's not just the how, it's not just the fact that you can now buy from used, you can now buy used goods ubiquitously in a way you never could before, but it's the why. Mm. It's because it's, it's also because you're voting with your wallet because you want to spend your money on products that actually have a good impact on the planet and on society. And, you know, if we can have a major impact in that space uh, and disrupt the fashion industry uh, and change it drastically from, this extractive damaging uh, model into something that's circular and beneficial, then, you know, that would be absolutely amazing. Um, and yeah, that would be, that would be an amazing place to be sitting from looking back. For sure. Ronan, I've had a great pleasure getting to know you a little better over the last 35, 40 minutes. And I wish you nothing but the best going forward, but thank you for being my guest today. Thanks a million. Have a good one. Cheers. We'll cut it there. Thank you very much for that. I appreciate that and I actually enjoyed it a lot. Yeah, likewise. Thanks, Emil. No it's worries. It's great to have uh, different questions on the podcast. Yeah, it was really good. Yeah, that's something I'm conscious of and I need to make a better effort of letting people know that in advance. But uh, I'm, I'm glad you liked it. And uh, as I said, yeah, I'll have it out in less than a week. But uh, for now, I'll, I'll let you go back to your day and uh, keep kicking ass. Great. Thanks, Emil, buddy. Talk to you soon. Take care, man. See you later. Cheers.